Hi, I'm Barry Ostrowski. At RWJ Barnabas Health, we believe that everyone needs to be informed about the important health care issues affecting their lives. That's why we're proud to support the important educational programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway. Funding has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health, PSENG, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. The New Jersey Education Association, International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. The Northeast Regional Council of Carpenters. The law firm of Gibbons PC. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. And by NJM Insurance Group. Promotional support provided by NJ Advance Media. And by Insider NJ. Welcome to State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. Recently, I sat down with Democratic candidate for governor, Ambassador Phil Murphy, and we discussed the issues that matter most to New Jersey voters. Here now is that conversation. Ambassador, let's get right to the issue of taxes. This $1.3 billion in new taxes. Break that down for us, but particularly the part that helps property tax payers, homeowners. So, the, we have to understand what the state of the state is, and this is among the weakest economies in the United States. We've been downgraded 11 straight times. We lead the nation in home foreclosures. Household income has not only lagged other states, it's actually down during the Christie Guadagno years. That's the frame. Uh, we need a stronger and fairer economy that works not just for some, but for all. Part of that is uh, making sure the folks who can afford it uh, step up and, and have a tax fairness, so that's the wealthiest among us. We have some blatant corporate open loopholes that we can close. Uh, <coughs> we can legalize, we think responsibly, marijuana and generate a significant amount of money. But far more importantly, we need to reprioritize what we're already spending. For example? So, so for instance, we've put out over $8 billion in uh, uh, corporate tax breaks for large corporations, uh, and at the same time, we've underfunded public education by $9 billion. We've canceled in <coughs> big infrastructure uh, projects and, and, and underfunded others. We've, we've, we've reduced NJ Transit state stipend by 90%. Um, so it's not just a question of where can we get more revenues, it's a question of how do we reprioritize what we're spending, and by the way, in, in addition to that, let's grow this economy again. We've left billions of dollars of economic activity on the table over the past seven and a half years. There's no reason we can't reboot some of those mm. economies that we used to dominate. Ambassador, let me try this. We, we, as you know and your team knows, uh, we've been asking questions for the last month getting ready for this interview. So these questions came from AM970, from NJ. TV, the Facebook page, from WNET, from Fios as well. But the, the, the marijuana question. Yes. Why are you so confident that we can legalize it, control it, manage it, and not promote any new problems as it relates to drug yeah. use? So um, let, me, let me tell you, Steve, the first lens and the most important one I look at this through is the social justice lens. We have the widest white, non-white gap of persons incarcerated in America and New Jersey. It's hard to believe it's New Jersey, mm. but it is. There are many reasons, uh, but the biggest one is low-end drug crimes. And so that's the first lens. I mean, I'm happy that it's, it, if we legalize it and we do it right, we'll generate revenues, but that's not enough. It's that's got, not the primary reason? That's absolutely not the primary reason. It's a social justice reason. Uh, we have an enormous inequity in the state. It's unacceptable. It has to be fixed. It's part of, not the only step, part of comprehensive criminal justice reform. Now, the, the, the second point I'd make is that I'm glad we're not the first state that's doing it. Other states that have gone before us have done some things right and they've done some things wrong. What have we learned? 
So we, we've learned uh, distribution uh, issues. We've learned its impact on medical marijuana, which this administration has gummed up with folks who desperately need access for medical conditions. And so you've got Colorado, you've now got Nevada, Washington, Oregon. We're studying those examples to make sure that we do it right. Uh, that, that, that's absolutely, just doing it uh, is not enough. Doing it right is important. The other thing, go back to the tax issue. What's fascinating to us, and again, uh, an insider NJ, it's a check out that website. There are uh, online partners for political issues. The issue came from there, from Fios, from Facebook, and my Twitter. Yep. Uh, by the way, put up a, the, the Twitter handle, if you will. People have been great with uh, questions, and they'll also comment on this show as well. But this question really is interesting. It has to do with your tax policy again. Some on those sites and others have asked, okay, so if you raise taxes on the wealthiest New Jerseyans, by the way, do you define that? Millionaires. And up. And up. Are you afraid of losing some of those folks who say, I don't want to be there because yeah. I'm getting overtaxed, then we lose all of their tax yeah. revenue? So listen, you, you, you want a state that's welcoming to all right. folks. We're the most diverse state in the nation. We are. Uh, folks over the past seven and a half plus years, uh, with all due respect to this property tax cap of 2%, property taxes are up 17%. NJ Transit fares are up 36%. Employee-based health care premiums up over 40 It costs 20% uh, more, more to send mm -hmm. your kid to college in the state. So folks rightfully are saying, wait a minute, where's all this money going? Um, uh, and so I'd, t I'd say back to property taxes, p pull out your property tax bill and look at what portion of that is public education. That's been underfunded, as I mentioned a minute we'll, ago. We'll talk about that. Would you fully fund the, and I don't want to get into the weeds here, uh, you can go on the ambassador's website and we'll tell you yep. more about his plan, but would you fully fund public schools based on what the state formula says yep. is supposed to be there? We would. And by the way, how would we afford that? We would. So um, let's just step back and say, what does that mean? Sure. There's one school funding formula in the history of our state that's been blessed by the Supreme Court. I believe they blessed it in 2008. And it was, it was viewed as a national model because it That's went right. away from, as you know, money chasing blocks or districts, rather, and, and money so following. Abbott, sorry for interrupting. So-called Abbott districts. Yes. And urban districts. Right? And instead following kids and asking the questions you need to ask, recognizing that not every kid is born with the same uh, set of circumstances or luck. Uh, what's your household look like? What language do you speak first at home? Uh, are you on free or reduced lunch as a measure of poverty? Do you have special education needs, et cetera? So it built that from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. uh, that, to me, is a, a very attractive, smart way to approach uh, funding public education. Would those dollars come from your tax plan? That's, that's a big part of where the, where the proceeds would go from, the, from not just the revenues we're talking about, but again, <coughs> reprioritizing. That's the bigger piece here. You talked about and you mentioned the $1.3 billion. It's a $35 billion budget. So it's not just where revenues are coming from as listed. It's what are you doing to reprioritize would you, would in favor of kids, in this case, the $35 billion. Excuse me for interrupting, no, no. Ambassador. Is there an area where you say, you know what? We don't really need to be spending the way we're spending on that. So reprioritizing in general is one thing, but specifically devils in the details. You yeah, say. I mean, I'll give you a few that come to mind, Steve. One is the corporate tax breaks. We're sending them out now uh, at, at the rate of many hundreds of millions of dollars To get businesses a year. to come and stay. Get what about those who say we wouldn't get them otherwise if we didn't do that? I think we need to be smarter about that. Should tax incentives be part of the package? Yes, I believe that. But we've used them, the Christie Guadano administration has used them as one blunt instrument, one size fits all, only focused on big corporations, by the way, not on the small businesses. Let's be smarter about that. We're throwing uh, hundreds of millions of dollars out there and we're not enforcing it. There are, there are deals that companies commit to employ folks to, to, to generate rateables mm. in terms of taxes. We need to be better about that. That's one. We've got out of network uh, uh, health care loopholes that are costing individuals and the state a ton of money. We've got hedge funds managing our pension uh, assets uh, and charging us uh, huge fees and returning very little. Are we getting a shaft? From I them? think we are. I think really? we are. Yeah. How would you change those deals? I'd get out of, I'd, I'd get out of uh, having hedge funds manage the pension assets. Listen, I think 30, 40 years ago when that asset class was first born, uh, they charged an arm and a leg, but they returned a lot. 
So you got Big what profits. you paid for. Big profits. Now? Today, they're still charging an arm and a leg, but the, the profits same. have gone away. And it's not just a passing phase. This has become a, this has become a pretty clear, uh, I don't know, permanent trend, but a long-term trend. There are a lot smarter ways to manage our pension mm -hmm. assets that are cheaper, that are at the same risk. CalPERS is doing it, the biggest pension fund in America. State mm -hmm. of Nevada, city of New York, there's no reason we shouldn't be doing it. You know, Ambassador, I asked the lieutenant governor this question. I'm going to ask you as well. Please. Um, your family. Who is your family and who is Phil Murphy, the, I hate to call it the reader, I man, is that old school, I'm going to date myself, the Reader's Digest version? A little bit about Reader's you. Digest, you and I will both do that one together. <laughs> it's okay. It still has value. Yeah, Go ahead. Oh, so I'm married to Tammy Murphy uh, for 23 years. She is my partner in everything. Uh, she's out there as hard as I am every single day. And we have, we've been blessed with four children. Josh is 20, a sophomore in college. Emma is 18 and taking a gap year before college and working on the campaign as Josh did last year. And Charlie's a junior in high school and Sam's a freshman in high school. We also have three dogs and a bird for the, you keeping track at home on the scorecard. It's a busy household. It's busy and noisy. And, and speaking of uh, young children, we're involved in an initiative um, that really deals with infants and babies and the kinds of things that state policy can do it's called Right From The Start NJ. It's a public awareness campaign that we're doing um, at the Caucus Educational Corporation. Here's the question. What, if anything, can the state do as it relates to those babies and infants, particularly as it relates to child care, if you will? Yep. So we have stood for a couple of things. One is we have stood for a child and dependent care tax credit, uh, which would allow folks to get uh, a much bigger tax credit to allow them to go out and work and feel like they can get someone to take care of their kids. Right now, we have too many folks faced with that horrible dilemma. Right. Uh, I'm desperate to work to put, to put food on the table for my family, but I can't, uh, I can't afford to leave my kids alone. There are smart ways to get at that. We stand strongly for that. By the way, you asked about kids, but the same thing could be said about parents and grandparents. Uh, my mother-in-law passed away not that long ago. My father-in-law was her caregiver. Uh, so I'd like to not only have a child and dependent care tax credit, but also a caregiver tax credit for, for parents and grandparents. Another thing we stand for is we want to get to universal pre-K as fast as we can. Can we afford to get it? Kids. Yeah, we can. I think we have to phase it in over several years. I don't think mm -hmm. you could do that on a moment's notice. Um, you know, I, I asked rhetorically, uh, who said it was a right to have public education between the ages of 5 and 18, but not before 5 and not after 18? Mm -hmm. So we want to extend both ends. We, want, we stand for, for free community college. Uh, which is cheaper than universal pre-K, but something we think we can get to relatively quickly, and universal pre-K, not just for some, but for all. Yeah, by the way, we're taping on the, um, actually the 17th, no, excuse me, the 19th of September. I woke up this morning and saw, um, happened to be in a whole variety of papers, that the ambassador was calling for free education at our community college. Correct. And by the way, there are uh, some great community colleges in this state. Why did you do that? And what do you say to those who say, great idea, but who's going to pay for it? Well, it turns out this one is, is in the scheme of things. First of all, this is an investment. So again, we've had an administration that would lead you to believe money gets thrown out the window. You know, where did my money go? Where did my property taxes go? Where did my income taxes go? Uh, when, 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 when you're seeing underfunded public education, underfunded infrastructure, those are rightful questions. This is an investment, and it happens to be a fairly modest one. So because the federal government plays such a big role in community colleges, this is probably a couple of hundred million dollars that we think we can phase in over a couple of years. Why there? Because if we are successful in reigniting the growth that has been lost under this administration mm -hmm. in the innovation and infrastructure economies, it won't just be PhDs and four-year college grads. That linchpin, that community college population is going to be incredibly important to fill those jobs. So we think it's a very good return on investment. Ambassador, these questions uh, around pension-related issues yes. come in from Facebook, Twitter, uh, WNET's website, NJTV's website, Fios, et cetera, et cetera, as well as uh, others who wanted to ask you this. The public employee pension situation is terrible at best. It's potentially a crisis. Yep. You had history a while back when you were, uh, was it a pension commission yes, under I, the Governor Cody administration? Yes, I chaired okay. the original commission on this uh, under Governor Cody. Should the state fully fund public employee pensions, A and B, if that were to happen, 
again, where would those dollars come from? Yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, the answer is yes, uh, period. Uh, why? Well, it's a matter of trust. We're a state that used to be respected and trusted. And if you're a public sector employee that's been left at the altar now for year after year and had things jammed down your throat, right. or you're a rating agency that's downgraded us 11 straight times, or by the way, a young kid, we lead the nation in exporting high school seniors. We lose them. We lose them. Now, at one level, that's a badge of honor. The world wants our kids. But at another level, you say, come on, can't you keep some of these, can't you keep more of our kids home? And we've got some thoughts and ideas around that. We must regain our trust the trust in this state. But what would that uh, have to do with the pension situation? Because I think you want, it, you want to be known as a state where a deal's a deal. We say, you know what, we're going to own up. Oh, sorry for interrupting, Ambassador. Yeah, yeah. Help, people, help people understand what the deal, as you interpret it, really was and is and how it's not being kept. So fully funding uh, the, the pension obligation. We wrote our report, as you mentioned, I chaired this commission 12 years ago. First recommendation of many, no more pension holidays, even 12 years ago. Explain it to people. Like, we're not paying this we're not year. Paying, we're not paying. Yeah, not pay. the, state, the state's been kicking this can down the road for going on 20 years, since the 1990s. And the cumulative impact is now almost overwhelming. So you, at some point, you've got to say, stop, enough. We're good for our word. We will pay and stand up for our obligations. I don't think you get there next Monday, but you have to show transparently and deliberately you're going to get there sooner than later and own up to our end of the bargain. Uh, by the way, in this one-hour special, um, New Jersey's next governor being seen nationally on C-SPAN, on WNET, WHYY, NJTV, uh, Fios, if you will, and mm -hmm. also on NPR affiliate WBGO, AM 970. Lots of different places, but the, the, one of the things that kept coming up, and the Lieutenant Governor uh, talked about this, he says, you know, we want to fully fund the pension as well. But she argues that we should sit back down with public employees and renegotiate, particularly when it comes to pension, but also health care benefits. She said, no, it's a Cadillac plan. Can't afford it, you say. Listen, it's hard. Just think about this for a minute. If you and I struck a deal, and it was over a course of 20 years, and uh, I welched on my end of the deal. And 20 years later, my first move was to say, hey, Steve, uh, could you sit down and make some more concessions? And then if you do, I'll get around to standing up to my end of the deal. What about if you were running out of money? We could find the money. Absolutely could find the money. We but could grow said this to me, economy. Hey, sorry for interrupting again. If you said to me, you know what, Steve? I know that's what we said, but the money's not there, you say. I would say that the, the, the stewardship of this economy over the past seven and a half years has been underwhelming by any measure. We've left tens of billions of dollars of uh, economic activity on the table, probably two to three billion dollars mm -hmm. of state revenue that could have put in, that could have been put to funding our pensions. We need real strong stewardship of this economy that finds that money, uh, that not only it talks about where we can get tax equity, but reprioritize what we're already spending and grow the pie. We need a stronger and fairer economy that works not just for some, but for every New Jersey family. And I think we can, with the right leadership, we can get that. If you're listening to us on the radio or not seeing the video, we're talking to Ambassador Phil Murphy, who is, in fact, the Democratic candidate for governor. The election is on November the... 7th, Tuesday. Right, Please get out and vote. Uh, yeah, let's do this. Let's nationalize it. Talking about elections. You were here, Ambassador, sitting right where you are in this beautiful NJTV studio, the Agnes Varis NJTV studio in North. And I asked you about Donald Trump then. That yeah. was in the primary. I said, what grade? It was yeah. not a good grade. Yeah. You actually went further than that to talk about how dangerous you believe he is. Yeah. You've had some time to yeah. see this presidency. Today, you say? Underwhelming. I mean, I, I, I don't see leadership that we need. I see lack of clarity on moral authority. Um, I see a sort of herky-jerky one day to the next, um, different uh, impulses. Did Charlottesville bother you? Charlottesville bothered me a lot. How so? Well, uh, at many levels. I'm, uh, as, a, as a human being, as a, as a dad, as an American, former national board member of the NAACP, former U.S. ambassador to Germany, where national socialism right. took root and led to the awful Holocaust and consequences. I think on moral authority, it's pass-fail. You can't get a C, gentleman C for that. You can't wiggle one position to the next. I hope we can find common ground. Uh, the president has spoken a good game, for instance, on infrastructure investment. We desperately need the federal government. Especially in New to, Jersey. Amen. To put that down payment 
and certainty on, on building the gateway tunnel. The gateway tunnel the, has to be done. Has to be done. Because to, so let folks know they here, gateway, what does that mean? Yeah, so they let people know why it's so let important. Me, let me go back and say that um, the, the, there's not been a new tunnel under the Hudson in over 100 years. There was a tunnel uh, project that was built up for years. The funding was found. The governor, Christie, the lieutenant governor, Guadano, canceled <coughs> that. Uh, the Arc Tunnel. I, I think a huge historic They wonder. thought it would go to the wrong place underground at Macy's. Yeah. They said, not a good idea. New it, Jersey gets the shaft. There was wide, wide view that it wasn't perfect, but it was a heck of a lot closer uh, to uh, perfect than it was to something that should have been canceled. And we've paid enormous consequences for the cancellation of that. So now we've got ne next up the Gateway Project which is a different version of the arc tunnel. Folks say in many respects it's better, fine. Uh, but the arc project, the tunnel, first st stage of which would have been opening early next year. Mm. So we're now eight to 10 years away, and we need the federal government desperately to put that anchor order into this. The Obama administration had committed half of it, which I think is about $12 billion. We need the Trump administration to do the same. And then the rest of it will be funded by New York, New Jersey, the Port Authority. Lots of folks on NJ.com. Again, those folks, I want to thank all of you for contributing so many insightful, thoughtful questions. But many folks on NJ.com, as well as on uh, uh, Insider NJ, wanted to know how would you, if you were governor, significantly, dramatically improve NJ Transit? Oh, Lord. Uh, start by funding it fully and putting the right people in the leadership positions. <laughs> Listen, I ask this question rhetorically a lot. If you are the fourth smallest state geographically in the nation, which we are. That's right. If you're the densest state in the nation, which, which we, we are. are. And if you sit next to the largest market in the world, which we do, you would think if you screwed everything else up, the one thing you'd get right would be commuter rail. And we've proven otherwise in this administration. So fully fund it, put serious, competent leadership in place, make it a much, stop crossing wires between the operating budget and the mm -hmm. capital budget including very important safety programs. Um, let's make the consumer experience a satisfying one. They're paying 36% more to ride NJ Transit uh, during the Christie Guadano administration than they were at the beginning of it. And you can't conclude in any way that their customer experience mm. is 36% better. So it's all of those steps. And we believe we can take them and we must take them. Let's go back nationally, <clears throat> but also as impact uh, here in New Jersey Please. on AM 970, on uh, Twitter on Facebook, other places as well. The question kept getting asked about the DACA decision. There are 22,000, by conservative estimate, uh, 22,000 dreamers in New Jersey. It's confusing as we do this program in late September as to where things are in Washington. Yeah. What's at stake and what do you believe should happen in Washington to resolve the dreamer DACA yeah. issue, but also the large immigration question? Yeah, well, so these kids are every bit as American as my four kids. So I find it outrageous, unacceptable, un-American that they're being shown the door. So well, The I'm, president says he doesn't want to show them the door. Depends on the day of the week. He did and then he didn't. I mean, this is a guy who's all over the place. Um, I hope cooler heads, I hope American heads, American values prevail. Uh, these are our most precious, in many cases, brightest assets, uh, in, incredibly important to our future. As you said, Steve, 22,000 in the mm. state. Someone told me they pay 60 odd million in taxes. They generate a billion six in economic activity. Over 90% of them are educated or in, in going to school or working. Um, it's an extraordinary group of folks who have had to, their whole life story uh, has in been this extraordinary. Country. By in the way, the, the rule of law thing, when you hear people say that, oh, it's the rule of law. We have to have the rule of law dict dictate here. And the president, uh, President Obama at the time, executive order, it's got to run out. He let them stay here. But that's not really the law law, no. you say. Listen, he hides behind an attorney general, Jeff Sessions, who's one of the most anti-dreamer elected officials or appointed now in the entire United Should States. Should Sessions go? I don't know about Sessions should go or not, but he shouldn't. Th these guys shouldn't be taken out on dreamers. Where's the compassion? Mm. You know, my, guide po uh, my guiding light is the poem on the base of the Statue of Liberty by Emma Lazarus. Let's open our doors wide. We are the beacon. Uh, people, people should want to still look up to our country and our values and say, you know what, that's a place we want to be. We want to bring our kids up in America and in New Jersey, I hope. Sanctuary cities. Yes. Uh, Lieutenant Governor has a clear point of view on that. She talked about yours. I want you to talk about your view on sanctuary cities. Listen, I wish we weren't ever even having to talk about it. I thought Hillary Clinton was going to get elected president of the United States, and we wouldn't even be having this, uh, this well, we discussion. Are. And we are. Uh, we'll do what it takes. 
uh, I think we're going to look back at this time in history and say that governors have, will have never mattered more, both in the day-to-day -day governing, because there's not a lot getting done in Washington. It's going to have to get done at the state level. Uh, but secondly, we're going to need governors who stand up with a steel backbone and push back on health care bills that would, that would ruin our state, tax plans that would ruin our state, and stand up on behalf of dreamers and immigrants. So if we need to be a sanctuary state, that's what we'll be. We need governors who have a steel backbone and say, Mr. President or Attorney General Session, you will not do that in the great state of New Jersey. Jersey. Ambassador, if you were elected governor, the biggest difference you would make if, compared to another person elected to governor, to be our governor, would be the biggest difference? I think I would go back to the fact, Steve, that I grew up working poor. My dad didn't get out of high school. My mom did. Um, we all worked. I worked under the table when I was 13. I slept in my parents' bedroom until I was nine. Uh, we worked hard. We didn't have two nickels to rub together, but we were happy. And that informs me today. Why is that? Uh, and why was that the case then in an imperfect America and not the case for that little kid in a working poor family today or worse yet in poverty or frankly too often in the middle class? And the reason is the deal used to be if you went to school, you got good grades, you stayed out of trouble, you're doing better than mom and dad. That's no longer the case for too many of our kids today. So the biggest difference I would make, this is an abstract. I don't have to read about this in a book. Mm. I want to lift those kids up. I want to govern this state for them and for their kids. That's it for State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. See you next week. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio at 2 Gateway. Funding has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health, PSENG, the New Jersey Education Association, International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the Northeast Regional Council of Carpenters, the law firm of Gibbons PC, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, NJM Insurance Group, and by these public-spirited organizations, individuals, and associations committed to informing New Jersey citizens about the important issues facing the Garden State, and by Employers Association of New Jersey. NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years, but just who are NJM's policyholders? There are medical care and emergency management providers, service professionals, men and women that move us and the goods and products we use each day, and New Jersey's next generation of leaders, the people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered.